Hello and welcome back to more functional analysis. I'm Fabian and together we are going to rewatch a video from the bright side of mathematics on metric spaces. In particular, I'm going to give you comments, insights and some examples to enhance your understanding of this abstract topic. Today, it's all about sequences of limits. So we are getting closer to the heart of approximation in abstract spaces. So let's dive into it. You might already know a sequence is just an ordered set of points inside the metric space X. Because we give the points names, you usually see a notation like this. Or in short, you just write Xn with n in n. Of course, in the formal way, you would say you just have a map from the natural numbers into the metric space X. So first, let me comment a little bit on notation, because while it may seem very easy in the abstract way, an abstract metric space and the sequence, things get a little bit messy when you talk about more concrete metric spaces, like we did in the previous episodes when we talked about spaces of functions. So let me comment on the, on the notation that one applies here and the pitfalls. So let's talk about sequences in a space of continuous functions on the unit interval. Yeah, as before, we can write a sequence f as a sequence of elements fn indexed over the natural numbers. Now, sometimes we also consider sequences on other index sets, but let's stick to the natural numbers. As we see here in the video, a sequence, first of all, is a mapping from the index set, the natural numbers in our case, to the metric space, which in our case, and this makes things a little bit complicated sometimes, is a set of functions. So we have a mapping that maps numbers to new mappings. An index, namely, is mapped to a function fn. So now we see there is another level, a deeper level of complexity here, because now every sequence element again is a mapping itself. More precisely, for every n and n, we now have fn to be a mapping from the interval 0, 1 to real numbers. So um, x, which is now just uh, a number between 0 and 1, gets mapped to the function value fn of x. So sometimes it helps to, um, well, to summarize what we see in terms of valuedness. So f here is a C01 valued sequence, while on the other hand, fn is an R valued function. And you see that these two levels of complexity um, can be confusing at sometimes if you recall, for example, notions of convergence that we will come into uh, uh, to look at later. Because if we are in the whole space, of course, we are interested in the convergence of the whole sequence, so the sequence of functions. But sometimes, as you may recall from your real analysis course, these notions of convergence also work locally. If you, for example, think about pointwise convergence, then we need to dive in a little bit deeper to see, okay, this is a notion that is locally, so uh, we need to look at the functions evaluated at a certain point. So best thing is to always keep in mind that the objects that you are mapping to in your sequence may be functions or even sequences itself. So it pays off to have a clear notation on this to distinguish and know um, what, what one is working with here. But now let's go on with the video. Because we can measure distances in a metric space, we can also talk about convergence sequences. A sequence xn in a metric space xd, which means all the xn come from the set x, 
is called convergent if there is a limit point we call x tilde. So what we want is that the members of the sequence get closer and closer to this limit point x tilde. Of course we already know how to measure such closeness, we can just use an arbitrary epsilon ball. It should be centered at x tilde, but then, no matter how small we choose the epsilon, almost all the members of the sequence should be inside this ball. More exactly, this means we find an index such that members with a bigger index lie inside the epsilon ball. Alright, so with this picture in mind, the picture that we have here on the right hand side, let us first give a sort of topological notion of convergence that is fairly general and does not use any uh, quantification at all. It can be just stated in a simple sentence. So we are talking about convergence here of a sequence. So xn converges to x tilde in our space xd. And just from the picture, we can say that this is if the, the case, if and only if xn is eventually in every epsilon ball. That is centered around the limit point. So this sentence helps us to decompose the parts that are uh, really important here. Namely, the first thing um, we, we want to notice is there, is there is once again this notion of distance or closeness here, uh, closeness here, specified by the epsilon ball. Recall that the epsilon ball contains all points with a certain distance to x tilde. So um, we are in sort of a, of a neighborhood of our limiting point. And then the, the second part I want to emphasize here is the word eventually, which means that um, there is a certain index after which we will not leave this neighborhood again. So eventually our sequence is not only in this ball, but it stays in this ball. Yeah, it could as well happen that the sequence leaves the ball and then comes again later. But it, if, if it is eventually in the, uh, the epsilon ball, around um, x tilde, it will stay there after, uh, after some time and then forever. So this about the eventually convergence here or the, uh, the fact that we are eventually in this, in this ball. And now the last part I want to emphasize is the word every here. Because we see some sort of parametrization here by the, um, by the radius so to say, that this ball has. And to, to say that it holds for every epsilon ball means we can make the balls smaller and smaller and smaller and we will still have the same result, namely that eventually the sequence will be in the epsilon ball. Of course, if the ball gets smaller, then it may take longer for the sequence to be eventually in the epsilon ball. But this is the statement of convergence, namely that no matter how small the ball is, the sequence will, after some point, be inside this ball forever. Now let's look at the formal statement from the video. Formally, this reads then, for all epsilon greater zero, there exists an index, capital N, such that all the other indices greater or equal this capital N, fulfill that the distance between xn and our limit point x tilde is less than epsilon. In this case, we then write xn tends to x tilde if n goes to infinity. Alternatively, we also use the limit notation. So we write limit n to infinity of xn is equal to x tilde. If you see such notations, please remind yourself that these are always given with respect to a metric D. So this is also the same that I did here above. I said the sequence converges to x tilde in the space. Yeah, it's really important to state this because there may be um, 
different spaces that the same sequence could be in. And if we talk about convergence, it really depends a lot on which metric and which space we use. And of course, we can use such notations because in a metric space, there can only be at most one X tilde that fulfills all of these things here. This is also a very important point here. So we are talking about the well-definedness of the limit. Yeah, we are assigning um, a limit point to a sequence and this needs to be well-defined. So there cannot be, there shouldn't be two if we talk about the limit of a sequence. You can easily show that using the triangle inequality. All right. I think this is a good thing to also do here in the video to show that limits of sequences or limits of convergent sequences in metric spaces are unique. Feel free to make a pause and try to prove it on your own. I will now prove it also here in the video. So first let's restate the thing that we want to do here. So we want to talk about uniqueness of limits. So uniqueness of limits. So this means there are no two limits. Given that the sequence Xn converges to X tilde in a metric space Xd. Now you see there are different ways to write this either with a limit or uh, just by using um, well, this arrow here, then we cannot have that Xn also converges to Y tilde in Xd for Y tilde being different from X tilde. It's a good thing for this uh, proof to um, to get a feel about what this what is going on here by making a little sketch. Namely, we take our two limit points, x tilde. Well, x tilde really is a limit point because that's that's why, uh, what we start with. And then we take another point, y tilde. And let's also copy some of the mechanics that we have here uh, on the left hand side in the picture, namely points x1, x2, x3, and then some sort of convergence against x. So what is happening now? So if we come back to our sort of topological um, equivalence here of, of the terms of convergence, it tells us the sequence needs to be eventually in every epsilon ball. And now we find need to find, uh, well, we can work now with this definition here to find maybe uh, suitable epsilon balls that show us something cannot happen. Because if you think about it in terms of this sketch here, then uh, you see that, well, it, it just cannot be possible for the sequence to also converge to Y because I could, I could just specify an epsilon ball of the size here. Let's use this one. And then y tilde will not be contained in this epsilon ball, right? Let's make the ball a little bit smaller. And let's draw a ball of the same size around y. And they should be sort of disjoint. So how can we find balls of these of this size? Because now we see that the sequence that stays eventually in this green ball will never go into the in the ball around um, y tilde. And as also mentioned in the video, this will have to do something with the triangle inequality. So let's do some some further things that we know that will work in metric spaces. We can calculate the distance between x tilde and y tilde and this distance will be d x tilde y tilde. Then let's look at the point. Let's say, say we, we'll take a look at this point here. It's inside 
the ball around X tilde. And using the triangle inequality, we can also see a triangle here with two distances. And the distance here in uh, purple will, of course, be longer, the sum of these distances, than the straight way here. So we also have, let's say this is a, just a point xn. Then we have a distance between x tilde and xn. And we have also here the distance between xn uh, and y tilde. Now let's make those ones purple. All right. And now we need to, to somehow show that the distance, so we, we know maybe also intuitively from the, from the definition of convergence, that the distance dx tilde to xn will always be smaller than the radius of this epsilon ball, eventually. And we want to show that at the same time, the distance to y tilde will be always larger. Yeah, so it, it is, I think, fairly obvious from this uh, from this drawing that this will happen. Only thing we need to find now, or we need to guess, is what could be a good distance to use here, or a good uh, radius of the balls to separate them both. And so, just guessing from this image here, what we could just do is we could just use the half of the distance between x tilde and y tilde. Yeah, because then we have two um, epsilon balls, one centered around x tilde, the other one centered around y tilde, and they will be disjoint. Yeah, so intuitively, if I have two disjoint balls, I cannot have the sequence inside the one ball and at the same time inside the other ball, if I really want to be eventually in one of the balls. All right, so far for the intuition, let's now start with the proof of the statement. All right, so let's uh, say we have y tilde that is not equal to x tilde. And of course, uh, we know that the distance dx tilde to y tilde is greater than zero because uh, of the positive definiteness of the metric. Yeah, this is a very important aspect that comes into play in this proof here. The metric is positive definite. Therefore, we really have this inclusion here. So what does, this, what does it mean just to recall that xn converges to x tilde. Yeah, we have it here on the right hand side. For all epsilon greater zero, there exists an n such that I, that I am in that eventually uh, in this um, in the epsilon ball around x tilde. Yeah, so for all n greater than this capital n that I that, that exists here, I am in this epsilon ball here. So how can we now use this definition of convergence? It works the following way. If I now just choose a value of epsilon, then knowing that the sequence converges, I know that there also exists a capital N such that for all n greater than n, I am in this ball. Let me do this uh, in writing here. So since xn converges to uh, x tilde. Um, yeah, we, let's first also fix the epsilon. So let's set epsilon to, well, half of the distance here, because these are now the balls that we want to be working with. So let's say epsilon is x tilde, y tilde, the distance between them, divided by two. And this is, of course, still a number greater than zero. And so now since xn converges to x tilde in our space xd, there exists 
a value n, which I will denote as n of epsilon, because this n, of course, de depends also on the value of epsilon that I used here, a natural number. So, such that um, I have the following for all n in n, the distance between xn and the limit is less than epsilon. So this is just from the definition. I plug in a specific value of epsilon and then the definition of convergence gives me back a specific value of n that I now can use to say, um, okay, I made a mistake here. So this is for all n greater than and epsilon. This is the n, the capital N I get back from the definition to now have this nice statement that the distance between x and and x tilde is strictly smaller than epsilon. So what do I want to show? I want to show that the sequence does not converge to y tilde. So let us also do this in writing. So we want to show that um, we have not convergence of xn to, um, to y tilde. So let me just copy the, the definition and we have here the negation symbol in front. So convergence would mean for all epsilon greater zero, there exists an n in n such that for all n greater than n, we have that dxn to y tilde is less than epsilon. But now we want to show it does not converge. Therefore, we have the negation symbol here in front. So this would mean we need to show there exists an epsilon greater zero, such that for all n and n, there exists a small n that is greater than n, such that, well, the opposite holds, namely that dxn y tilde is greater or equal than epsilon. Yeah, and this is, so if you compare this with our sketch here above, this is precisely what, what should happen intuitively, at least from the sketch. Yeah, um, that namely, once I am here in a very, uh, close neighborhood around x, I will have a minimum distance to y tilde that I cannot go below. And this is this is what this last part here tells us. So the distance will always be greater or equal than epsilon. And well, this epsilon we need to find here. And we have already a candidate, namely uh, this value here. And we'll see whether this goes through. We mark this a little bit lighter. So a good thing to do now would be to, to collect first what we have. So, so we know for all n that are greater than n epsilon, yeah, this is the n epsilon I have uh, from the definition of convergence for the sequence xn. We make this a little bit more visual. So for all n that are greater than this n epsilon, I know on the one hand side from the convergence that dxn x tilde is strictly smaller than um, epsilon, which was nothing else than d x tilde y tilde divided by two. So on the other hand, if you come back to the graph, we have also here this triangle that relates to the distance of dx tilde and y tilde. So other thing we know is that the dif distance between dx tilde, uh, dx tilde y tilde is less or equal than dx tilde xn plus dxn y tilde. Yeah, of course, this would hold for every n in the natural numbers, but let's 
uh, stick to the case of n being greater than n of epsilon because then both of these inequalities hold. In particular, um, we now have a relation between both inequalities because we have dxn x tilde here and dx tilde xn here. Note the metric uh, is also symmetric mapping, so I can just switch the order of the arguments here and plugging this in. So give me let this be the star here. Um, we have dx tilde y tilde over 2 plus dxn y tilde. So, and we're almost done now here. Observe the next thing, namely I have dx tilde y tilde on the left-hand side and I also have it on the right-hand side. So, really show how it now all works together. So, we chose an epsilon precisely for this part so that we can subtract now the purple um, marked portion on the right hand side from the left hand side. Also going to do this now. So, um, so rearranging now gives that dx tilde y tilde over 2 is less or equal than, well, that uh, part that um, remains on the right hand side dxn y tilde. So now let's come back to what we wanted to show, right? We wanted to show that the sequence xn does not converge to y tilde. That means we need to somehow deduce an inequality of this type. So dxn y tilde is greater or equal than epsilon. So we have dx and y tilde here on the right hand side. And now let's see what do we have on the left hand side. Well, this here was just epsilon and epsilon is greater than zero. Perfect. So we have already the type of inequality that we want to have for, for in order uh, to this for the statement to be true. We also have a definition of epsilon here in light blue. The only thing that we need to check is now that all of the statement makes sense. So let's go, go through this one more time. Yeah, if we want to show that a statement like this holds in a proof for every exists, we need to specify something on our own. So there exists epsilon greater zero. So in this case, we would just say, well, take epsilon gleich uh, equal to dx tilde y tilde over two. Then there comes something that we, well, have no control about because the statement says for all n and n. So, well, let's give a, uh, let's, let's say we have some n and n. What do we need to show? We need to show that there exists an n greater or equal than this n such that this inequality holds. So now we need to dive into the proof again to see how we need to choose the small n in this case. Yeah, and there, there is a little case distinction that we now need to do. What we namely need to do is we need to distinguish cases on this n here yeah, because if n is a number that is smaller than n epsilon, right? The n epsilon comes from the convergence of xn. Then we take n just to be equal to n epsilon. All right, let's fix just this first case and go through the proof quickly again to see that it makes sense. So we take this epsilon, then we take a small n that is equal to n epsilon, then it precisely also fulfills the initial statement here, namely that for all n greater or equal than n epsilon, we have, well, that this proof carries through. And at the end of the proof, we have here in red the statement that we wanted to prove. 
All right. So in this setting, the proof carries through. So there's one case missing, right? We need to cover all natural numbers and we have only covered the case that n is strictly smaller than n and epsilon. So the other case that we need to cover is n greater or equal than n epsilon. So in this case, we just take um, n equals to n, n equals n, and let's see if the proof carries through again. So if n is greater than n epsilon, and I take n equals n, then n is in particular greater or equal than n epsilon. Well, this is precisely the, um, the assumption that we started this proof with in the first place. So of course, the proof will once again go through. And at the end, we see, all right, in red, we have precisely the statement that we wanted to deduce. All right, what have we proven now? We have shown that given a sequence xn that converges to x tilde, this limit is unique, meaning it cannot converge to another element in the metric space. And if you look closely at the proof, you see, well, the main ingredient that we used here was the positive definiteness because this allowed us to choose an epsilon that was strictly greater than zero for the um, negated sta statement to be proven by us. All right. Later, we will see a lot of examples of convergent sequences. Therefore, I would say we start. So the proof now, uh, the video now goes in a different direction, but I want to give you now some examples of converging sequences. And before we do this, I want to reformulate once again this convergence statement in a way that makes um, calculations more easier in terms of uh, yeah, real analysis and working with inequalities. So of course we have here this nice formal statement with uh, quantifiers at hand that tells us what does it mean for a sequence to converge. And I want now to give you a real analysis version of what we see here. So namely, so let me just copy the main part. So xn converges to x tilde in the space xd. So when is this the case? Look at it closely. It just tells you something about the value of another sequence. Yeah, so we have a sequence of elements in the metric space. And if the sequence converges, it basically tells us something about a sequence of real numbers, namely the sequence of distances, dx and x tilde. And you know from real analysis what it means for a sequence of real numbers to converge. So what I want to do with now is interpret this statement in the sense of a sequence of real numbers and real analysis. And well, we do not have to wait long because it's fairly obvious once you check the, the definition. So the real analysis version just tells us that we have convergence here. If the limit from n going to infinity of dx n x tilde is zero. So a sequence in the metric space converges to a limit point if the sequence of distances is a zero sequence of real numbers or null sequence. Yeah, this is this is what this is precisely what is standing here, and it it makes computations far more easy, as you will see in the next example. So this is the real analysis version of the convergence definition that um, yeah we can use fairly often, and we also uh, are going to use it in the next example which is, of course, an example in a space of functions again. So we have seen this space of functions uh, a lot in the past. Uh, I will still give you the, the main definitions here. So our space xd will now consist of the set of continuous functions on the unit interval. And the metric that we are going to use is the one metric. Yeah, the one that comes from an integral. 
of absolute values. And we will see how this works out uh, in, this, in this proof. We want to talk about convergence. What else do we need? We need a sequence. And it will be a sequence of functions, of course, because we are now in the space of functions. So let's see if I'm able to sketch the problem and uh, hopefully you can then follow along. So we are in, on the unit interval and the first function of my sequence will just be well, the linear function f1 and f1 of x will just be x. Yeah, it is one here at one. And now the second function I want to draw is x squared. So you may have seen the sequence in uh, other examples before. Um, it's, it's a very classic sequence to consider here. It's all continuous functions and it goes on. So f3 will be x to the three and so on fn will be xn. And now we have already an object at hand that we can now study with the new notions that we know about metric spaces. Namely, the question would be now, well, we have a sequence, does the sequence converge? And if it converges, to which value does it converge? And to answer this last question, I'm going to give you more insights here on the sketch. So you can, of course, also use a computer to sketch this, but um, what will happen here is um, the following. So F2, the parabola, will be a little bit more bent here. Or maybe maybe not look at the point one and also do not look at the point zero because these are fixed points. Um, to get a better intuition, let's maybe look at a one half because then um, we should come out here as at one fourth. Yeah, because one half to the two will be one fourth. It will be smaller, of course, than the one half here. So F3, you can now do the math for yourself. At one half, it will be one over eight, right? So once again, maybe down here. Um, let's see if I, if I hit the point. Okay, so this will be F3. So in some sense, we see some movement of the graph, right? So it, we have a straight line and then this line bends and bends and bends. And so mainly all of the points that are not the point located at zero and not the point located at one, they bend and they seem to approach zero. Once again, recall, we have a sequence of function, but I can also look at the sequence only at one point. So let me maybe limit our view to just, well, just what happens here along one half. So we see that the points are moving downward. So one guess could be that, well, the longer the sequence runs, the closer we get here to the x-axis. So how, how, why, why did we now start with the sketch? Let me remind you, we want to find out what could be a possible limit to then check whether the sequence converges to this limit. And well, our guess could now be um, that the function g of x equals zero for all x in zero one is a limit of our sequence fn. So let's first of all check that this is at all possible, namely that we do not leave our space. Yeah, Because sometimes you have an idea about what could be a, a limit and then you completely forget about the space that you are in. We are in the space of continuous functions and okay, this is the constant zero function that is in particular a continuous function, uh, a continuous function. The zero function is continuous. Therefore, we are not leaving the space. That's good. So we can talk about convergence. And I presented you with this nice, uh, well, equivalence of, um, 
of convergence via the real analysis version, because this is precisely the one that we are going to use now. So um, we need now to look at the distance between the elements of our sequence and our limit point. So what we need to look at is uh, well, the D1 metric of Fn, our sequence member, and our limit G. And now for, um, yeah, now I can also well, recap the definition of the one metric here. Well, it is just the interval from zero to one of the absolute value of Fn minus G here. And these are functions that I integrate with respect to X, with respect to the argument, fair enough. So now let's plug in the definitions that we have here for G and for F. So we have the integral from zero to one. Fn of X is just X to the N. Yeah, this was the definition that we have here. G is just a zero function minus zero dx. Yeah? G is zero for all X on this interval. So in particular, you see this from the from the sketch, but it's also nice to calculate it. Um, x to the n is always positive. So I can get rid of the absolute values. So I'm basically just integrating xn from 0 to 1. And this is an integral that we can uh, easily solve. Um, well, the result will be just 1 over n plus 1. So I did not say anything about n here. Um, n was arbitrary, so this here holds for all n in n. So we want to talk about convergence of. Oh, sorry. We want to talk about convergence of these values here of distances, and we now have a nice expression that allows us to to use this limit real analysis definition to just calculate it. So the limit of these uh, distances here, so the limit of the D1 distance of Fn to G is nothing else than, well, I have an e equal sign here, than the limit of N going to infinity from one over N plus one. See how we are changing worlds now. We are in the, in the left-hand side of the, equality sign, we are still in a very abstract setting of metric spaces and metrics and functions. On the right hand side, we are back in real analysis, calculating the limit of a real valued sequence. And this we can do, and it's easy to see that the limit of the sequence is just zero. So now we zoom out again, and what do we see? Well, a zero on the right hand side, and the limit of distances on the left hand side. Well, this is just nothing else than the real analysis version of convergence in metric spaces, namely that the sequence of distances of sequence members to the limit point is a null sequence. So what have we shown now? Let me summarize this. So Fn converges to zero in the space C01 with a D1 metric. Yeah, and keep this example in mind because you may recall that the sequence does not converge in every uh, space of continuous functions depending on the metric. So there are other metrics uh, in which this does not work out well. It does in the one metric, and I think it's a good example to, to see how uh, convergence works here in spaces of functions. Let's go on with the video. Out here proving another important fact. Here we look again at a subset of the metric space X and we can say that this one is closed if and only if we can't leave the set from the inside by just using sequences. More exactly, this means that a limit such a sequence could have must lie in the set A. This is fitting for our visualization because closeness means that this boundary we see here already belongs to the set A. 
Writing that down gives us then for every convergence sequence AN, where AN is just an element in capital A. So it's a sequence inside A and usually one uses the sloppy notation writing it down as a subset of A. The important thing here is of course we have a convergence sequence, but only in the sense of the definition. So it's a convergence sequence in the space X. So it has a limit inside X. However, for the proposition we need more, we need that the limit that we know exists is also an element of A. Okay, so this is important because now we have a characterization for closed sets just by using sequences. And this is indeed a very handy way to think about closed sets because it comes up very often when talking about approximation and also uh, a term that is called denseness of sets in other spaces. But let's not get ahead. Let's first uh, start by looking at an example of a closed set and see whether we can use this nice characterization of sequences to uh, check a set for closeness. So we are still in the metric space as before. The continuous functions on the 0, 1 interval with the D1 metric. And the set that we are going to look at is the set A of all functions G from C01 that fulfill the following property. We want their integral from 0 to 1 to be less or equal than 1. Yeah, so our question is whether A is closed or not. All right, let's just get along with uh, this nice characterization and see where it goes. So the proof goes the following. So it says for every convergent sequence, I need to show that uh, the limit of this convergent sequence lies again in A. So if I want to prove this, well, I, I choose a sequence Fn that needs to lie inside um, A. Yeah, so this is, this is the basic ingredient. This is the first line here. And the other part is that this sequence converges. So I also need to have a limit. So let's say the limit is called F tilde, but F tilde a priori is only an element of the continuous functions on the unit interval. Okay, it's a limit, so I also need to say that Fn converges to F tilde in our metric space, so C01, D1. All right, so what, what do we need to show? Uh, we have a sequence, the sequence converges. Um, ah, right. So we also need to show that the limit from which we already know it exists. So it, this example is completely different from the one we covered before. We need now to show that this limit is uh, an element of our set A. All right, so we need to check whether the limit of the sequence has anything to do or does fulfill, let's say it like this, it does fulfill the property here. So we need to show that F tilde is an A. So this means we need to show that the integral from 0 to 1 from F tilde of x dx is less or equal than 1. So once we show this, we show that F tilde is an A. And as we did it with a arbitrary sequence, um, we have shown that A is a closed set. So this is a very nice calculation. Um, let's just quickly do it. So um, let's just start, start with the, with the left-hand side of this inequality, right? So 0, 1 integral of F tilde of X dx. So and 
Um, what I'm now going to do is, is a little trick using the triangle inequality. We have seen it a couple of times here now. Um, let's do it again. We just fiddle in the object that we know something about, which is fn of x. Yeah, so I'm using the triangle inequality here. And I fiddle in fn of x. Yeah, for some for some n. Why am I doing that? Well, I do not know anything about f tilde, but I know something about the distance of fn tilde to uh, to um to from f tilde to fn. And I also know something about the fn's because the fn's already are in A. So let me rewrite uh, everything again. So um, the definition of d1 now tells us here the left part is just f tilde to fn. And on the other side, I'm just going to copy this. We have still the integral of fn x dx. Well, perfect. Now I can use the definition of A to see that the left hand side, well, it's not um, well changed by that, but the right hand side is 1. So now let's see. I have here an n that was not specified so far, so I can say that this all holds for all n in n. Yeah, in particular, I have that. So the left hand side, f tilde of x, is strictly smaller than d1 f tilde fn plus 1 for all n and n. So if this holds for all n and n, in particular, it holds for the limit. Yeah, and we are back in the setting of real analysis. So I can just uh, conclude that the integral of f tilde of x dx is strictly smaller than the limit of n going to infinity of d1 f tilde fn plus 1. So, but, but now recall the real analysis version of convergence in metric spaces. This just means that the sequence of distances is a null sequence. So I have here just 0 plus 1, which equals 1. But this is precisely what we wanted to show, right? The left hand side, the integral of f tilde is strict uh, is less or equal than one. So this implies that f tilde is an element of A, and as fn was an arbitrary sequence in A that converges, we have shown that A is a closed set. Perfect. It's time to close the session. Thank you very much. Um, for, for being here today. Let me know via the like button whether you learned something new. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, let me know in the comment section. I'm looking forward to it. And well, have a nice day. Goodbye.